This last saying of Jesus from the cross comes from the gospel according to St. Luke, chapter 23, verse 46. And when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And having said thus, he gave up the ghost. It's the word of committal, the word of committal. As the first word of Jesus from the cross was a prayer and began by addressing his father, so it is with the last word from the cross is a prayer addressed to the Father. The first word was for others. And now this last word is for himself. You know, it's a good thing to be able to pray for yourself. Uh, you, you may not be able to get in contact with the preacher. Uh, you ought to have a communication line with the Lord for yourself. John chapter 19, verse 30, reported that he bowed his head and gave up the ghosts. Luke, however, is more explicit in details relating what Jesus said at that time. And when the curtain rises on this final scene at the cross, what we see is a divine act accomplished by the will of the Godhead. The quotations from the Psalms indicates that Jesus' mind was on the word of God. Psalms 31 and 5 was one that he had learned as a child. And if we had the time to examine all of the scriptures, which are background for the seven last words, we would discover certain favorite passages of our Lord. The psalmist declared, into thine hand I commend my spirit. Thou hast redeemed me, O Lord, God of truth. You know, childhood memories are strong when individuals face a time of death. It is often reported with near-death experiences that people claim that their whole lives pass before them. As Jesus lived, so he died. His last thought was to the scriptures he had learned as a child. Unlike the common criminals of that day who were punished by this cruel and extreme punishment of crucifixion designed by the Roman Empire, they sometimes would use oaths or curse words as their last expressions hanging on the cross. But Jesus came to this last hour with the word of God in his heart and on his mind. The idea is also found in the Psalms that declares, thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. If we allow the word of God to dwell in us richly, it would be our comfort and our security in the hour of our death. The master's example here is one that touches the conscience. He always prayed in communion hours with his father throughout all of his life experience. This is not 
uh, praying in an hour of crisis or an emergency. I mean, there is no fervent gasping for God's help in the time of trouble. There's no phantom search for a bridge over troubled waters. No call for mercy for sin. No plea for divine intervention for a spiritual emergency. You know, too often we neglect that experience uh, the power and presence of prayer in our lives. And I can assure you that when folk get in trouble, they know who to call on. They're not trying to dial the church. They're not looking for the pastor's cell number. No, I'm going to talk about when you're in serious trouble. Yeah, you're not looking for your uh, BFF. Lord, help me here, Jesus. Uh, you're trying to get on the main line and tell him what you want. His word, his word is simple. It's the quiet assurance of being with the Father in his eternal presence. Now, it's significant uh, that neither of the four apostles who penned the gospel records of the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord, never said that Jesus died. That is how it is recorded for us. But his death was the last act indeed as the Lord of life. When a man dies, it appears he is mastered by death and held in the clutches of the icy fingers and clammy hands of death. The forces of life yield to the finality of an unknown mystery. Yeah, Paul addressed that issue for us in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. He said, behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. He did not attempt to explain this transformation, but he did suggest for us to give thanks to God, which gives us the victory through our Lord uh, Jesus Christ. Now we cannot tell how or when death will come to any one of us. I mean, uh, you can uh, be shot six times by a gun and still live. At the same time, you can get into your car and bump your head and go into judgment. As the master who takes the sting out of death and withholds victory from the grave, lays down his life, folds it up like a vesture and changes his state from time to eternity. The record reveals that he dismissed his spirit, a reminder that his death was not a catastrophe, it was not a fatal accident, but the climax and the consummation of a divine plan of God. Yeah, the Bible said, he was the lamb, slain from the foundation of the world. I wish I had a little help in here. And after all, you understand that whatever belongs to you, you have the right to lay it down and to pick it up again. Y'all gonna help me? The Reverend Ralph G. Turnbull says in his book, on the seven last words, that Jesus made an April fool of death. Life and death are in God's hands. There has been no one who has experienced death and ever returned to tell us what was on the other side. 
You remember Lazarus? When God called him back from the dead, Lazarus never spoke about what was on the other side of life. That centurion's daughter that Jesus raised made no reference to the other side of death. The widow's son, whose funeral possession on their way to the cemetery, that Jesus stopped and raised that young man to life again. He made no statements of what transpired on the other side of life. The rich young man, uh, in the parable of Luke chapter 16, that rich man desired to return to his father's house to warn his brothers of a place of torment. It's the only reference that we have of someone desiring to give a report to what transpires on the other side of life. But the Lord said to him, or rather Abraham spoke and told him, they have the preachers, and if they don't believe what the preachers said, neither will they be persuaded by one who came back from the dead. What Jesus did at Calvary was no leap into the dark. He was simply making a transition from death unto life. He shared what he was going to do. I mean, after all, he had said to his disciples on occasion that he was going away to prepare a place for us so that where he was, we could be also. You see, Jesus had come from heaven to earth, and he knew the way back home. Somebody said that the way of the cross leads home. He was familiar with the road from earth to glory, and he was just making a return trip back to his father's house. In his first word, he prayed an intercessory prayer. He said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Paul told the church at Corinth, had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. I mean, as long as he was on the ground, the thief could keep on stealing. As long as he was on the ground, the liars could keep on lying. Uh, as long as he was on the ground, the pimps could keep on pimping. Y'all not going to help me here. Yeah, but they made one mistake. They forgot that Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men unto me. In the second word, he, he worked a miracle. He suspended the dying process, and he put death on hold just long enough to save a dying thief and uh, gave him a promise. He said to that malefactor, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. That male factor discovered the system of salvation. He understood that you need to seek the Lord while he may be found and call upon him while he's near. You know, salvation in itself is a miracle. It took a miracle to hang the stars in place it took a miracle to hang the moon in space. But when he saved my soul, cleansed and made me whole, it was a miracle of love and of grace. In that third word, he took care of his earthly connections. 
saying, Woman, behold thy son, son, behold thy mother. You have to take care of business in this life because it's too late after death to take care of business. Y'all help me here. Yeah, I have a sister who sings a song. I pray that we all be ready for his return. Can I tell you that when you buy life insurance, you're taking care of business for those that you leave behind. Insurance is not for the dead, it's for the living. I mean, you may have travelers and feel secure under the umbrella, but you need to abide under the wings of the Almighty. You may have all state and think that you're in good hands, but I want to tell you, you need to put your hand in the hand of the man that steal the waters. The man who calmed the raging sea. You may have prudential and own a piece of the rock, but you're not going to be sufficiently taken care of unless it's on Christ, the solid rock you stand, and all of the ground is sinking sand. In that fourth word, he, he became sin for us and cried out to God. They thought that he was calling on Elijah when he said, Eli, Eli, lama shabbatani. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? They didn't realize there were 10,000 angels just waiting on the word go uh, that could rescue him from the cross. But it was in that moment he became sin for us. And you know God can have no fellowship with sin. In that fifth word he explains his purpose. He said, I thirst. It was not for water because water can't get thirsty. Besides this, he was water in dry lands. As a matter of fact, he was the river of life. But his thirst was for the souls of men. And uh, his thirst was for the unrighteous. His thirst was that all men would come unto him. In that sixth word, the plan of redemption had now been completed. The road to heaven was no longer blocked by the wrecking crews of hell. The highway of holiness was now paved with his glory. The veil in the temple was now rent in two so that no longer was a priest necessary to offer sacrifices for us or for a sacrifice to be given for us on our behalf because uh, Jesus paid it all and all to him I owe and now uh, on the cross his final word like his first word was a prayer every Jewish child had learned uh, to pray this prayer for Psalms 31 and 5. Into thy hand I commit my spirit. It's much like the prayer that we learn sitting on mama's knee when she taught us to say, Now lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die, before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. In a dying hour, childhood memories become very strong. When we face death, it's often reported that we're near with near death experiences. People claim that their whole life 
flashes before them. I recall in those last eight minutes and 46 seconds, George Floyd cried for his mama who had already preceded him in death. But Jesus may have recalled the sacred scriptures he had learned as a child for committal to God. You know it's a good thing to be in the hands of the Lord. Somebody has left on record that the safest place in the whole wide world is in the hand of God. You see, at his birth, he was in the hand of Mary. At the age of 12, he was in the hands of the doctors and the lawyers in the temple. At the river of Jordan, he was in the hands of John the Baptist. While he was fasting in the wilderness, he was in the hands of Satan in the synagogue. He was in the hands of the rabbi in the temple. He was in the hands of the priests in the garden of Gethsemane. He was in the hands of his enemies. On Thursday night, he was in the hands of Caiaphas and a quadrant of Roman soldiers. But early Friday morning, he was in the hands of Caesar. A little later, on Friday morning, he was in the hands of Pilate. At the third hour of the day, being nine o'clock in the morning, he was in the hands of his executioners. At the fourth hour, he was in the hands of a Roman soldier that nailed him to the cross. In the fifth hour, he was in the hands of the crowd that ridiculed him. In the sixth hour, yes, he was in the hands of those who were passing by, wagging their heads as he was hanging on the cross. In the seventh hour, he was alone and forsaken by God under the cloak of darkness when the sun in the middle of the day refused to shine. In the eighth hour, he was in the hands of a centurion who took his sword and pierced him in the side. A songwriter looked at it and said, there is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins and sinners plunge beneath that flood. They lose their guilt and stain. But now in the ninth hour, about three o'clock in the afternoon, he lifted that bloody head from that wounded body and he cried out in a loud voice, said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit there there at the cross where my savior he died there at the cross from sin I cried there at the cross was the blood applied saying glory 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 to his name in a loud voice he declared fall into thy hands I commend my spirit and the Bible says there he gave up the ghost can I tell you he died he died oh he died yes he died for your sins 
and my sins. He died so that you and I could have a right to the tree of life. He died to bring us in relationship to God. He died so one day we can be with him on the other side. He died. Yes, he died. I know he died. Yes, Jesus, he died on the cross for you and for me. At the cross where I first saw the light. Yeah. Day. At the cross, at the cross, the seven sayings of Jesus from the cross. Let's come to a conclusion with this service and this message on today. But I want to ask you if you have been listening and watching, or if this may be your first time tuning in, do you have the right relationship with Christ Jesus? If you don't, He's already paid the price. He died for your sins and for my sins. And there's no doubt about it, for the record says, all have sinned and come short from the glory of God. If you're out of the ark of safety, if you're not in relationship with him, I want to ask you if you'll just pray this simple prayer with me and say, Lord, I believe Jesus to be the Son of God. I believe that he died for my sins and that you raised him from the dead. I repent now of all my sins, and I ask that you will come into my life and uh, create in me a clean heart and renew the right spirit uh, within me. If you prayed that prayer, my friend, then I want you to know right now, right where you are, you are saved. If you believe that in your heart, and confessed him with your mouth, you are now saved. You may be in a honky-tonk, in a bar, on a dance floor, it does not matter. If you said that and believe that, you are saved right now. And I want to encourage you. I know many church doors are still yet closed, but as soon as you have opportunity, find you a church home. Join that church where the gospel is being preached and you can walk in the newness of life because from this very moment until your dying day, you have relationship with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. May God bless you. May God keep you. It's our prayer. And we will continue to be praying for you wherever you are that you will walk in the newness of life and in the fellowship of his Holy Spirit. Oh, at the cross. At the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart was rolled away. Oh, it was there by faith. Oh, I received my sight, and now I am at the cross. At the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart was rolled away.
Well, good morning again. We're so grateful to God to have you watching and viewing our live stream services from the Church of the Living God, Temple 145. We're located at 3711 Biglow Street in the Oak Cliff area of Dallas, Texas, 75216. I've come to ask you this morning for your consideration during this season of pandemic to help us to continue the work of the kingdom as it relates through our work here at Temple 145 by making contributions. If you'd like to make a contribution, you can do that by going to our website. Our website is cotlg145.info. That's cotlg145.info. If your banking institution is Zell friendly, you can also contribute to our work and the ministry here by going to cotlg145 at att.net. Again, if you're Zell friendly, then that contribution can be cotlg145 at att.net. Or if you simply like to correspond with us and mail contributions this way, prayer requests, or any other correspondence that you'd like to share with the Church of the Living God, you can address your uh, correspondence to the Church of the Living God, Post Office Box 411489. That's P.O. Box 411489. Dallas, Texas, 75241. We'd appreciate so very much hearing from you. And we want you to know that we're lifting you and your families up in prayer. And then knowing that during the season of the pandemic, that God will take care of you. In the interim, as we await for your contributions and your correspondence, we're praying much. And we pray God's blessings upon each and every one. Thank you.